Welcome back to the channel, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know in the chat if you can hear me and see me okay. Sometimes the audio gets a little weird. I think we're doing good. Appreciate you all all joining in. We have a really special guest today. His name is Ethan Nadelman, the founder of Drug Policy Alliance. Ethan, thanks so much for taking the time. Hey, man, it's my pleasure to be on your show. Um, so let's... You don't have to go too deep into it because you have such a long history. But just to give so those people a backstory that that don't don't know your story yet, uh, do you want to kind of kind of give that how you how you got into the uh, the drug policy world and, and uh, why you started Drug Policy Alliance? Yeah, sh sure, Matt. I mean, I mean, you know, it's I spent most of my adult life in the cause of drug policy reform which basically means ending the war on drugs. And you know, I mean, obviously I got interested initially because I was 18 years old a long time ago and started smoking weed when I was in college and enjoyed it, wondered why it was criminalized. Uh, but then I was in my 20s in graduate school, interested in the issue, landed up writing a PhD, became an assistant professor at Princeton, started writing and speaking about what was so crazy and ridiculous and counterproductive about the war on drugs. And then after a year, a few years of doing that as an academic, I got a call out of the blue one day from George Soros, who was interested in this area. He had just played a pivotal role in the fall of uh, communism and socialist dictatorship in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And he was asking himself, what in America is the antithetical to open society values? And the war on drugs was one of the first things that hit him between the eyes. So he gave me a call. We had lunch. And then kind of the rest was history. I left the university set up an advocacy organization that eventually became the Drug Policy Alliance, became the leading organization in the world advocating for alternatives to the war on drugs, and really focusing on three main issues, Matt. The first third of our work was about ending marijuana prohibition, first for medical purposes and then more broadly, and replacing it with a responsible system of legal regulation. The second issue was ending the role of the drug war in mass incarceration, and the third was making a serious commitment to treating drug use and addiction as a health issue, not a criminal issue. And that's where my deep involvement in harm reduction began with respect to illicit drugs. And throughout this time, I kept an eye on the whole, you know, issue of tobacco harm reduction. It seemed to overlap with my work on illicit drug harm reduction. And then when I stepped down from running Drug Policy Alliance about two and a half years ago, uh, this issue started to draw me in. Yeah, it if if anybody ever wants to go down that rabbit hole sorry i got a little bit of echo again i'll i'll get over it if anyone wants to go down the rabbit hole google ethan watch some of his old interviews from the 90s it's kind of masterful the way you kind of incrementally introduce people to cannabis legalization you didn't start mm -hmm. out you didn't start out just you know let's recreational everywhere it was it started out as a medical thing talking about uh uh you know especially uh uh uh, you know, people that are dying, cancer patients, stuff like that, because you kind of had to ease people into it a bit. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, in my, in my academic years, in the late 80s, early 90s, it was really about the broader principles and making the case. But beginning in the mid 90s, when I started to get more political, and the first of those with the med was the medical marijuana initiative in California, where a couple of local activists had drafted it, but I was able to pull together the funding and the campaign to make it a real political victory. And my view there was that medical marijuana was really two things. It was, on the one hand, really about the rights of people who use marijuana as a medicine to have legal access to this and their right to be first in line when it came to no longer be being treated as a criminal for the use of marijuana. But we also had to hope in the intention that in opening up the medical marijuana issue and in legitimizing that, that that would help transform the broader public discussion around marijuana in a way that would ultimately lead to broader legalization for adults. And in fact, it turned out that way. So it was about being political in our, in our strategizing. And obviously, a lot of the lessons I learned in those things, whether it was with respect to marijuana decriminalization legalization or whether it's with regard to harm reduction, it's the sort of stuff that's always in the back of my mind now as I'm getting more and more engaged in the battle over tobacco and nicotine harm reduction. Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's that's one area where we've struggled a bit in, in tobacco harm reduction is messaging and and kind of opening eyes a bit and, and, and getting people kind of incrementally over to our side because tobacco use has been so stigmatized over over the decades. You know, a lot of it for good reason, obviously, but but yes and no. Um, 
it, it's been difficult for us to to create the the proper arguments to 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 get people over into our camp. What do you, what do you think are are some of the best ways to do that as far as just kind of changing hearts and minds when 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 people just have this big tobacco 2.0 um you know scenario in, ingrained in them. Well, I mean obviously sticking with the facts, the truth is obviously pivotal on this stuff. I mean, I mean, you know, Matt, you're one of the ones who've taught me about the evolution and emergence of the whole, you know, vaping world and how that had nothing to do with big tobacco, really. And in fact, has been antithetical to big tobacco. And so part of it's just about continuing to put that information forward and calling out the people who claim that all of this amounts to big tobacco. I think that's one thing. I think that... Um, you know, part of it is just the basic element of harm reduction. The element of harm reduction is accepting and acknowledging that both young people and old are going to engage in activities which may be undesirable or risky or dangerous. Uh, and that the first response may be to say, don't do it, just say no. And that works for some people or quit. And that works for some people. But that for large numbers of people, they are unable or unwilling to quit doing the thing that they enjoy, that they like. And therefore, the objective has to be to make that activity less dangerous. Right? That was the basis of needle exchange, to reduce the spread of HIV AIDS among people who were injecting uh, illicit drugs. And illicit drugs wasn't causing AIDS, right? It was basically the, the and, and heroin wasn't causing AIDS. It was the sharing of syringes that had been infected. And it was sort of making this argument that, yeah, you may want everybody to stop, but the number one thing has to be keeping people from dying. And the same thing with getting people to switch from heroin to methadone. A lot of people are saying that's just substituting one drug for another. Methadone's harder to get off of than heroin. All the anti-methadone stuff, the horrible stigma. And so much of that we see playing out again with respect to tobacco and e-cigarettes and nicotine, a uh, nicotine replacement. So it's about sort of holding people's hands. Sometimes it's actually also about asking what people would want if it was their own relative. You know, I mean, what if you're asking people, if you if you're, your father, your brother, whatever, is smoking, what would you want? What if they can't quit? You know, it's just, it's putting it on that very personal human level that sometimes helps people get to where they need to be. Yeah, I I see a lot of parallels with, with opioids. I, I'm someone that had, uh, uh, you know, I had my own... Uh, troubles with opioids de a decade ago because I hurt my back and and the same arguments are used where it's just it's just swapping one thing for another and because people they, they don't it's almost like they're more worried about the addiction than than the harm itself sometimes and and they 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 look at it as a, like a having your cake and eat it too scenario like vaping is just uh, another way for you to enjoy a drug as opposed to a uh, a way to save your life yeah, no, I, I think that's right. Remember, we have in America a very attach, a very deep attachment to the notion of abstinence and yeah. sobriety. And it's always important to remember that the United States was one of the few countries in the Western world that banned alcohol, right? We had a temperance movement, you know, a great temperance movement in the late 19th, early 20th century that resulted in the national prohibition of alcohol. You know, and that failed experiment for 14 years. In fact, we're just right now celebrating, you know, I think the 100th anniversary of that of that entering into effect. And, and in a way, that belief in sobriety, that almost quasi religious belief in it, that that on some level, this body, my body, this is God's vessel. And I have an obligation to my Lord and my maker to keep this vessel of God's, you know, free, drug free, free of, of impurities, free of these dangerous substances. It was a key element that drove alcohol prohibition. And it's been a very strong underlying element with respect to all of the illicit drugs. And I must say, I didn't see it coming up so fast with respect to back to tobacco and nicotine. But now you have, you know, it, it's interesting because now we've people have remarkably, um, you know, begun to become more accepting of people getting high smoking marijuana. And we're beginning to see some real old things with respect to psychedelics, primarily their legitimization as a medical thing. Yeah. We're beginning to see some, some growing acceptance around heroin and cocaine, not as a recreational drug, but around the notion that people who are addicted should not be stigmatized and punished um, because they are addicted. 
But it's, it's almost as if that as we're easing up a bit on all of those, that in a way, every society needs a boogeyman. Yeah. And in America, we need our drug boogeyman. And right now, you know, cigarettes, but even more so e-cigarettes and vaping has somehow become the new boogeyman, the thing that we can all attach our fears, our fears around our children, our fears around addiction, our fears around loss of control. And that, that current runs deeply in the U.S., you know, at the same time, I have to acknowledge that in the illicit drug area, we often look to Europe as a role model for being pragmatic in harm reduction policies. But in this issue, sometimes some of the European countries are just as backward on tobacco harm reduction as we are here. Yeah, and I think about that topic a lot and and why we see some in politics that are are so gung ho on on harm reduction when it comes to other uh, other drugs or uh, marijuana legalization, but they they have this big blind spot with vaping, and you know maybe you can give me your input on that. Some of it I think is like a corporate thing, you know, like they see big business coming in trying to addict their children. But I mean, isn't that good? Isn't that what happens when you legalize alcohol again or? cannabis, you know, if we have recreational. Well, you know, see, I mean, I think you're right, because I've talked, you know, it's interesting, especially I'm, I'm sitting in San Francisco right now. I live in New York, but I'm in San Francisco. And I've talked to some of the people who were in p- politically my great allies in California on drug policy reform, you know, helping out on issues like overdose prevention and clean needles and, and medical, mar- medical marijuana and marijuana legalization and rolling back incarceration. And they were great on this stuff. And yet some of those same people have been leading the charge to ban e-cigarettes. And clearly, I noticed that when I when we talk and I come at them with all of the scientific evidence, read this article that just appeared in Science, read this piece, look at the evidence, look what's really going on with adolescent use, look at the potential harm reduction benefits of this for current smokers, 35, 40 million American smokers, look, this is a reason why these, these, these e-cigarettes can be so effective, da, 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 da. and they don't want to talk about the evidence. It keeps coming back to big corporations and especially big tobacco. And then especially when Juul, when Juul kind of had that double double boogie, right? Where on the one hand, they were rapidly becoming enormously popular with young people in a way that other e-cigarettes and the vape devices and open systems never had become quite so popular. And on the other hand, selling a third of themselves to Altria, which really was big tobacco, Right. When they did those two things, they became the big tobacco reigniting the threat to our children. And I think that just kind of sees the political imagination, especially the liberal imagination, although obviously not just liberals, when you look at the bipartisan support for crackdowns in this area. And I think that really was a major piece of it. I think the second thing that went on is that there was some element of believing oh my God, we finally have big tobacco on the ropes. Cigarette smoking is dropping among adolescents and adults and, and we're going to get them. And, and, now, and now, damn, these e-cigarettes are coming up and kids are developing a whole new attachment to nicotine and tobacco, et cetera, et cetera. So there was that piece of it. Part of it was that um, the anti-e-cig folks, the anti-vaping folks, took come a couple of lines that the, that the anti-marijuana folks had tried for over and over and over. One was the gateway hypothesis, that you do this and you go on to harder drugs. And here it was, okay, you're going to vape and you're going to go on to smoking cigarettes. The other one was the adolescent brain. You know, oh, smoking weed is going to destroy the adolescent brain, damage your IQ. And in both cases, you know, there were little bits of truth to each of these claims, but they were overwhelmingly just bullshit. You know, I used to refer to the gateway hypothesis as an ounce of truth embedded in a pound of bull. And the analyst and brain stuff was more or less the same. And those things just ran out of steam on the marijuana front. And now they've kind of been reignited with respect to the anti-vaping front. So you had that piece as well. I mean, the, the major difference in a way in this fight is there's not, at least as yet, there's a big class dimension to this issue around the fight over vaping and tobacco harm reduction, which you also see in the illicit drug area, especially on the opioids. What you don't have in this area, at least as yet, is the race dimension, which has been so powerful with respect to illicit drugs, yeah. but not really much of a factor in this one as yet. Yeah. I mean, on, on the on the business point, it seems like if we get federal cannabis legalization, you're going to have some big players that are going to pop up there as well. And then what is it going to get demonized again? Because you have multi-billion dollar corporations selling weed 
to, to people. I don't know. Well, I mean, I don't I mean, I'll tell you, I, I'm worried because like, I'm delighted. I mean, look, I devoted a big part of my life to working to legalize marijuana and marijuana prohibition, have responsible regulatory policy responsible regulatory policies. I knew in theory that, you know, big business was going to end up playing a major dominant role once we legalized and a lot of the mom and pop shops, um, I, you know, were going to basically struggle to survive or even go out of business. And that was one of my regrets about what it was that I was fighting for. Um, but I'll say that marijuana is, um, you know, marijuana is a drug. And there is a minority of users for whom it's a deeply problematic drug. I know people who have a terrible time with marijuana. So, I mean, I think marijuana is, you know, there's, I think, going to be a growing uh, health concern around marijuana use that's now kind of in, it's subsided a bit, but I can see that well coming back around. Um, you know, there are some people who got in cavalier about the potential health, health elements of marijuana. So, and I think once big business starts to play a bigger, bigger role, as marijuana gets more and more normalized, there could be issues around that. So I think, and remember also, these things always go in cycles as well. They always go in cycles yeah. as well. You know, I mean, it's one reason there's that cyclical cyclical element that makes me hope and think that maybe some of this anti-vaping hysteria with respect to nicotine is going to begin to fade as more and more of the science comes out as, you know, hopefully the kids stop doing as much of it as they've been doing. Um, So we'll see. Yeah. Well, and on that, I mean, it seems like it's never going to go away for for as long as we have groups like Tobacco Free Kids getting funded with millions of dollars to you know, and then, like you said, we're their new boogeyman. Um, so that they oh, they, they kind of always need a purpose. It seems like it's true. They do. Although I'll tell you, back in the day, in the late eighties, nineties, the Partnership for Drug Free America was getting oodles of money from um, you know all sorts of places, and a lot of that was focused on anti marijuana stuff. So sometimes, you know, the, the even well funded campaigns, when they begin to reach too far and lose their connection with American public opinion. I mean, right now, you consider, for example, the fact that as a result of all of these scare tactics that have been put out by the anti vaping groups, as a result of the miscommunication, I think, deliberate by the Center of Disease Control and to some extent by the FDA, as a result of the sensationalist things being put, put out by politicians, as a result of all the crappy media coverage, you now we now live in a time where a majority of Americans, 60 to 70 percent, believe that vaping nicotine is as or more dangerous than smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And there's believe the exact opposite of what is true. It's also the case that for a long time, I think over 50 percent of Americans have believed that nicotine is what is the reason that cigarettes kill people. Right. As opposed to just hooking them, but not killing them. And so you have massive misinformation out there. Now, I think the challenge on behalf of, you know, for us, harm reduction supporters is basically to just keep ramming home the information. What's been lacking so far is any kind of independent funding. I mean, one of the things I'm looking at right now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of semi-retired. I'm figuring out what role can I play. I'm, you know, I'm enjoying getting more knowledgeable in this field and beginning to speak out and do interviews and this and that. But what's clearly needed in this field is funding that does not come from the e-cigarette or the tobacco world. Because right now you have Bloomberg putting in a couple hundred million dollars to this. You have other foundations putting in. You have government funding being strongly, both state and federal, being strongly anti-harm reduction. You have the International World Health Organization being strongly anti-tobacco harm reduction. On the other side, the tobacco companies could afford to put in money to counter that, but anything they put out is tainted by virtue of their being involved. And what you really need is somebody like the role that George Soros played in kind of teaming up with me 25 years ago where we could begin this long-term effort, you need essentially a George Soros type philanthropist, somebody who has no financial involvement in the tobacco, nicotine, vaping field, but who sees that this is a major hypocrisy, that this is a violation of human rights, that is antithetical to public health, and that we don't want to have a whole new drug war emerging where tobacco is the subject of a criminalized drug war in the way that marijuana was in the past and cocaine and heroin still are. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's why you need to go to George Soros and be like, hey, what do you think about Bloomberg? I mean, he's stop and frisk. Yeah. He's not a friendly fella. Let's let's no, fight him. I, you know, I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, Soros and Bloomberg, they barely know one another. They met some years ago. 
Um, and I know where George called out Bloomberg a bit on his intensive, you know, stop and frisk yeah. policing and arresting huge numbers of young people in marijuana. Um, but, you know, at this point, uh, George, you know, he's 89. There are threats to open society all around the world, you know, fundamental threats to human rights. So, you know, although I think he's aware of my interest in this, I'm, I'm not about to go pitch him yeah. for something like yeah, that. Yeah, it seems like that's one issue is like in this day and age when there are so many things going on, like it seems like a minor fight to some people. Uh, yeah, I mean, thank God he's kept his commitment to the uh, broader drug policy reform struggle and continued supporting my old organization, Drug Policy Alliance, and the global harm reduction effort. He's still the number one funder good. of that issue in the world, which I'm very glad about. But I don't think this is something he's going to expand into. Yeah. Um, Alex Clark from CASA actually asked a good question here. He said, uh, curious what Ethan thinks about the notion that vapor products should be approved and marketed as therapies before being phased in as recreational products like cannabis. You know, I mean, first of all, I'm looking forward to meeting Alex one of these days. I admire what he and Kassa are, you know, are doing here, trying to do in the U.S. Um, you know, if one were to go backwards and to say how might this have evolved, um, I mean, obviously with medical marijuana, we need it. And now with psychedelics, they need to go the medical route before there's any possibility of looking at a non-medical form of legalization. I think in the way that um, the tobacco, the, the, you know, the substitution products are, I don't know if that would have been viable. I mean, one when one sometimes thinks, could there be some compromises? You know, there's now this issue, should they start to ban the 5.0 or 50, was it milligram or whatever, you know, e-cigarettes that Juul and others produce or, or limit it the way they do the UK to, I think it's 20 milligrams or something like that. And it raises questions, well, maybe the higher dose should only be, you know, by prescription and the lower dose would be over the counter or, or you, know, you know, compromises like that. But my understanding is that, Given the fact you already have this thing out there, it's already being used by millions and millions of people. It's already there's what roughly three million people who have already de who have already made the switch. I mean, I think that's the best estimate that there's roughly three million people who have switched from cigarettes to yeah. Basically I mean, there's there's millions anything. more of dual users, but like complete switch. Right, there's a whole that's, spectrum. Yeah. Right, there's another seven, eight, ten million dual users, which range obviously from people who primarily smoke and vape a little to people who primarily vape and smoke a yeah. little. But in terms of people who truly made the switch, it looks to be about 3 million people. So how one then says, well, let's make this medical um, or require those 3 million people to all go the medical route at this point. And I mean, if one, if one were to make that incredibly easy, like to say, OK, we're going to make it only by prescription, but this prescription will be as easy to get as a prescription for Viagra or a prescription for, you know, anything where doctors just write it off. And, you know, you know, maybe there would be something there. But in point of fact, the FDA has got to go through a process that's going to go years and years and years before something can become medical only. And even when you do that, you start if you go that way, you start adding to the, the cost of the healthcare care system. And then the notion is, would that actually make it substantially less accessible to young people? And that's where it might around the edges. But the thing I can't forget is that we had an entire war on marijuana for almost a century where we arrested tens of millions of Americans, largely adults. We spent tens, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars to ban it for adults because we said we were worried about the kids. But for, throughout that period, who had the best access to marijuana the entire time? The kids. Yeah. Right. So the notion that we're going to jumping through all these hoops to make, you know, uh, flavored e-cigarettes less available, maybe banning all these cigarettes in order to protect the kids. And if marijuana is any guide, the kids are going to be the most resourceful and the least risk averse in terms of continuing to get what they want, whereas it's going to be adults who might use this as a harm reduction vice who are going to be most effectively deterred by all this overregulation and prohibition. Yeah, and I have a hard time with it too because vaping is such a like spur of the moment on a whim thing for so many people where like they were at the gas station one day, they saw some some weird contraption, said, oh, I'm going to try that too. And then all of a sudden they liked it and they went down that road and ended up quitting smoking completely. So a lot of people accidentally kind of, do, you know, they sort of fall into it. And if you take well, it- you know, I mean, 
Now, as I say, the analogy here is with harm reduction in illicit drug area. You know, there, you know, I remember in some early years when we were in some states which did not want to allow needle exchange programs. And so there was an effort in some places like Rhode Island to allow to increase access to sterile syringes with a prescription. Right. So doctors could prescribe a, a sterile syringe in states where you needed one to to get that. But the truth is, with people who are addicted to heroin or cocaine, it's oftentimes the same thing. You know, they're addicted, but almost anybody who's addicted to those drugs goes through a few minutes or a few hours or a few days where they think they want to quit. And then they go back and they want to quit and therefore making it making it easy access to get what it is they want. Right. To get the clean needle. Or the same thing, you know, one of the problems with methadone programs oftentimes is that you got to wait, there's a wait list to get into the clinic yeah. or you got to schlep down to this place and, you know, and all this. And it's why there have been all these proposals to make methanon and buprenorphine access to the United States more like it is in other countries around the world, where if people want to get it, they can get it quickly when they have that impulse to do something that's less dangerous. And I think that that's the, that's the nature of harm reduction. To some extent, harm reduction is about non-medicalizing the alternatives, yeah. right? There's a yeah. medical approach to dealing with addiction, and there's a harm reduction approach to dealing with addiction, and they overlap, but there are major elements of harm reduction, which is basically antithetical to medicalization, which says keep the doctors out of the, their controlling role in this and let us as adult human beings with all our foibles and all our frailties have the ability to try to help ourselves when we can, when we want to reduce the harms we're doing in our own lives and sometimes to the people around us. Yeah, I mean, I think with vaping, it's one of those times where the you know, the open market worked out. I mean, because flavors were a user driven thing, you know, like you and I have talked about that before, like people created what they wanted to help them not smoke. And whether that was some weird banana cream pie flavor or whatever, peanut butter and jelly, like they, they, cre yeah. they you know, but, but nowadays, you know, it's just these flavors, they, they, they frame it like, you have a bunch of scientists in a lab in a big tobacco lab that are creating the most addicting flavors for youth when that's not at all how this how this all started. Right, no, exactly. In fact, it makes you wonder now, right, with the ban that Trump announced on the flavors other than menthol and tobacco flavor and with the bans you're seeing around the country. I mean, interesting question. So if you look with respect to young people, well, some of them will just stop doing it because they can't get blueberry or tutti frutti or whatever it might be. Some of them will switch to menthol or tobacco flavors in all likelihood, which may make it more likely that they, that they will go on to smoking because they'll develop a familiarity with the way that tobacco tastes. Some of them will switch to cigarettes um, because, you know, one of the things that, you know, people are always saying, well, oh, my God, adolescents, you know, the, the smoke rates are dropping so much, um, but they're beginning to vape. And oftentimes the correct way to say that is smoking among adolescents dropping so much in recent years. And one reason for that may be the increase in vaping, right? I mean, it was one of the biggest proportional jumps, I think, ever, maybe the biggest proportional the drop biggest ever. For the last four the years. Biggest, right, in the last couple of years, yeah. right, coincides with the jump in vaping. And there's reason to believe that, that vaping should claim some of the credit for that. Meanwhile, with respect to adults, my understanding is, you know, if you have longtime smokers who are looking at trying to do dual use or to phase out, they may go for a tobacco flavored, a menthol flavored vape, you know, initially. But oftentimes people want to forget about the flavor of tobacco or they begin to lose the taste for it. And so shifting into the mint or the flavors or the whatever the other sweet or fruity flavors is a way to stay on, help stay off of cigarettes. So there's this element about the ban on flavors on that that just uh, I mean I get why they're concerned about it I get the concern why it's more appealing to kids when it tastes good like that but to ignore entirely the fact that adults like the flavors as well and that flavors are an important part of people quitting or not getting into it I, you know I think that's where CDC and all the other players are being incredibly disingenuous yeah that's the flavor argument is one of those that's very difficult to explain to non vapors and to uh, you know politicians and and whatnot. Uh, you have a part of it is like you're disassociating yourself because when I quit, I was like, okay, well, I obviously need to. Be, I smoked Camel Lights. So I obviously need to get a Camel Light flavored liquid, and it, it'll be a one to one thing, and that's what'll help. I quickly realized like. <laughs> 
that's not what I wanted whatsoever. And then you had the variety where you could change your flavor up every couple of weeks. And so you had these advantages with vaping that smoking didn't have that I think helped um, urge a lot of people over into, into that camp. Even some people that didn't necessarily even care about quitting smoking in the beginning, they might have, they might have, you know, they, they went to vaping because it was cheaper and they had more variety and it was honestly just a little more fun and more interesting for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I mean, even I think it was my friends who made the switch, you know, at this point they say, why, once you become accustomed to vaping, why would you want to go back to that burnt tobacco? Now, some people still like the old time feeling of the cigarette and the smoke yeah. and all this sort of stuff. But a lot of people really just lose the taste for it. And that's what you want. I mean, like, 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 you know, the other thing, of course, that's here is that the argument that needs to be said, and yet it's almost impossible to say it in the broader political environment, is to really look deeply at the question of what is the real issue around adolescents getting into vaping, right? Now, we already know there was a wonderful study that came out just a few days ago by Dave Abrams and Ray Niar and a bunch of others um, that basically looked at the monitoring the future data on vaping and then made the observation that the large majority of people who vape, in fact, had already tried cigarettes or were dual users with other tobacco products and also observed that if you looked at the question of how many people had never tried a cigarette or other type of tobacco product, got into vaping without ever having tried tobacco before and had now become regular smokers, you were talking about 0.4% of, of vapors who had never smoked becoming cigarette, you know, serious cigarette smokers. So if you look at it just purely in terms of adolescents who start to vape, then one has to ask, well, what are the issues there? Now, the first most obvious one is that there's something a bit offensive about businesses or corporations pitching products which are appealing to young people, right? And then to be and then some of them becoming dependent for life yeah. on this thing. The idea of getting a 14, 15, 16 year old and there there there's some group of them that will never quit, da da da. And so there is something problematic and offensive like, like that. Even if this stuff causes minimal harms or something problematic, right? The second thing is um is what are the real risks? Now, the adolescent brain stuff, you know, Mike Bloomberg going on national TV and saying, if your kids vape, they're going to lose five to 10 points off their IQ for life. I mean, the fact that the guy who's running for president and the number one donor of the anti-vaping effort is muttering and supposedly believing that kind of bull. I mean, that's a scary thing. That's a true fanatic in an incredibly powerful, powerful place. But if you look at what were the studies that shows that there's a problem, you know, with, with, with the adolescent brain, right? You basically have some animal studies, you know, rat studies of limited potential value to human beings. And you have the big question, if there's a real risk to the adolescent brain, what about the hundreds of millions of Americans, including America's greatest generation, you know, 50% of whom, at least of the men, were addicted to cigarette smoke, and we, cigarette smoking, and we never talked about what was happening to their brain. So, I mean, that whole argument seems a bit, a bit disingenuous. Right. Yeah. The gateway thing, or oh, we just went through that, all sorts of reasons to believe that that's not really going to pan out to be very much. Although all these bands may actually push it, people, kids into yeah. into it's a self fulfilling stuff. prophecy kind of like yeah. you, know, you do these bands, you you you're they're more exactly. likely to, exactly. to go to cigarettes. And then the question is, so what are the long term negative consequences of vaping? Well, there's that very small possibility that there's something about vaping that actually is problematic for the lungs in ways we haven't detected as yet. Obviously, the fact that as there's more research being done on the vape devices, on the batteries, on the you know chemicals that, that are in the flavors in this, that we might be able that we'll be able to reduce whatever risks there are even more. But so there's a slight risk that we can't totally you know say doesn't exist, but it's a very very small risk. You know, is that risk any greater than the risk that the mobile phones we have next to our heads all the time are going to cause that to increase the rate of brain tumors or something like that? I I, I don't know. I don't know, but quite, quite likely not. Or how those risks compare to a whole bunch of other things that we do, including having sugar or fats or all the other things in our diet, which may present probably greater risk to young people than taking a nicotine. We know that with respect to cancer, you know, there appears to be almost no real link between, you know, nicotine causing cancer by itself, right? And then you have the evidence from Sweden, 
where people had been doing snus, you know, the oral nicotine thing for decades. And now most of the old data is people who had initially started smoking. So it's hard to get a pure take on people who were pure SNUS users, never having smoked, going into cancer. But the evidence appears to be that SNUS presents remarkably little in the way of long-term harms to health. So it raises this issue that if there were no hysteria now, and if in fact, you know, we see millions of people, young people getting into vaping, and we know that, you know, any number of them percentage will continue doing it. And if we were to somehow project out 30 or 40 years from now, where today's adolescent vapors are now in their 40s or 50s, and some percentage are still doing it, well, the question becomes, what do we think are actually going to be the harms associated with that to their health? And of course, the other question, which is, are there any potential benefits? Yeah. Are there reasons yeah. to believe that getting into vaping may reduce the likelihood of young people getting into other illicit drugs or reduce the likelihood of them having other problematic behaviors, say, for around food, right? You know, I mean, so we don't know those things, but those are the things that are essentially can't even be part of the public dialogue right now because when you say kids, it's as if rationality and sensibility and perspective and context go out the window and we have to, you know, do anything yeah. in order to, you know, put a barrier between kids and these substances. That's always one of those arguments that vaping advocates have in the back of their head, but they know it's not super useful. Like, well, you know, they're not smoking. It's, you know, what what are the harms really? Or or are they potentially treated, you know, self-treating depression issues and th things like that? But uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't yeah. go over super well. You know, I find the the whole rewiring your brain term just problematic in itself because it's it, there's no way to really measure that it's more so like any kind of habit can rewire your brain especially as a teen so if i give my kid candy every day and that's his new habit or, or right. addiction that his brain's rewired you know we, we're, we're giving our kids uh adderall and stuff like that every day that's yeah. obviously well, rewiring thing. their brain. I mean, I mean, quite frankly, the TV that's on today is very different than the TV was on 40 years ago. I mean, you know, the, the rapidity of, of the, you know, the, the screen changes every couple of seconds now or every one or two seconds. And parents are being told, don't let your young, young kids watch big screen TV or then kids being on these phones all the time and being basically addicted to mobile phones and all of this stuff, you know, uh, pinball machines, video games. It's all rewiring the brain yeah. in some respect. And the brain. Brains are, I mean, it's true, adolescent brains are developing, they are plastic, etc. But they're also quite resilient in many ways. And we oftentimes underestimate the extent to which adolescent brains are resilient. I mean, there is, of course, trauma, there are things like that. But also, you know, I think we, we get into this I mean, I think one reason why, why, why the anti-marijuana folks, it was sort of their last stand really about 10 years ago, was to try to hype that adolescent brain thing as much as possible. And, and, you know, in the end, people just didn't really buy it. Yeah, well, they're buying it again now. P people have really short, yeah. short uh, memories, though. They don't, they don't, yeah. they can't draw the parallels if they're not really thinking deeply about, about this topic. Um, well, I mean, for me, it's dispiriting, too, because, you know, my own politics are, are generally left center. You know, I'm a sort of what you might call a social justice libertarian, by which I mean I care a lot more about, you know, economic equity and social justice than libertarians do. But I care more about personal freedom than a lot of liberals do. Yeah. Right. And so my politics are kind of in, in that camp. And I have to say, seeing a lot of my liberal friends and allies and political allies kind of jumping on this drug war hysteria because the drug is now nicotine or vaping, it's dispiriting. It makes you appreciate that on some level they didn't get the broader principles. Fortunately, the people who work and fight in the illicit drug harm reduction area, they tend to get it yeah. pretty quickly. Yeah. You know? That that was one bright spot to me over the last few months with with all the vaping hysteria is we did start to see, you know, because we we had these horrible news articles every day and, and everybody's just talking bam, bam, bam. And we started to see some of the contrarians pop up and be like, whoa, hold up, guys. You know, do you mm -hmm. not understand what you're doing? So like in the harm reduction uh, realm, we saw people like like yourself speaking up. But then we also, you know, even some journalists starting to kind of, well, let's pump the brakes a little bit. And like, we're, yeah. we're doing it again, guys. Well, you know, I mean, the problem is like you get this great, you know, the, the wonderful uh, economic columnist, Joe Nocera, 
used to write for the Times, now writes for, actually courageously writes for Bloomberg, Bloomberg News. And, you know, he did a nice piece on the recent science article by by um, uh, Cheryl Hilton, the former head of the Legacy Project, you know, and uh, Dave Abrams and Amy Fairchild, uh, another dean, and a bunch of others. I mean, so you yeah, have that piece pop up as a column. You have a piece pop up in the New York Times questioning the value of increasing taxes on e-cigarettes or equalizing them with regular cigarettes. You'll have a piece here in the Washington Post, a piece here in the Wall Street Journal. The problem, of course, is the headline writers and oftentimes the, the principal reporters writing for these major news outlets, never mind the television stuff. And, when the, and remember, most Americans, right, probably including us, get what we know about the news primarily from headlines, right? We leaf through the headlines, whether it's TV, whether it's Internet, whether it's newspaper. We see the headlines, and that's it. And if you were to just look at the headlines, overwhelmingly those things are going to reinforce incorrect understanding of this issue and of the science. And, I mean, for me, I, I mean, I've talked about this publicly before, I, you know, I've been in New York for most of my life, and I'm born there. I've lived there the last 30 years or whatever. The New York Times, to me, is a great, one of the great bulwarks of democracy. It's one of the things, you know, who was it, Benjamin Franklin or somebody who said, you know, give me a, give me a, free, you know, free, a free press or uh, the free vote. The press is the most important. I think a pivotally crucial important paper. But I saw them do the worst coverage sometimes on the drug issue, on the marijuana issue, on the cocaine issue, on the ecstasy issue. You name it. And now I see them oftentimes when that poor fellow in the Midwest died over in the fall, right? An older oh, guy yeah. died and his family said he had ne- he could never have used THC. This had to be a pure, you know, nicotine vaping thing. And they put that on the front page with a long profile. And then the Times does this half hour video news program once a week. They made that the focus. Now, look at the CDC acknowledging that it appears that the entire lung disease thing was between 90 and 100 percent about tainted, illicit tainted THC vape cartridges. Right. The power of that New York Times front page story and video special in terms of really misinforming its elite educated readership was monumental. And the CDC retraction, I think it's maybe maybe it gets a a little kind of corner piece in the New York Times right now. And what the Times did, which should which does and should hold itself to a very high standard. That's been true of almost every other media outlet outlet out there as well. You know, same time. So we get the you know the the Jonas Sarahs and the John Turneys and the the people writing some good stuff here and there from an economic perspective, but but it, it's against this onslaught and Bloomberg funded onslaught and and jump on the bandwagon onslaught onslaught that's um. You know, just so powerful. Basically, it reminds me of of what I was dealing with back with the drug war in the late 80s, early 90s, when everybody across the political spectrum was on the drug war bandwagon and just a few people were stepping out saying, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I think the damage is done at this point and it could take years to undo it. I saw a new stat um, where, I mean, even in Canada, it's it's twice as many people now think vaping is is as bad or worse than smoking it's up to like 60 percent in the last like year it's that's over a year's time so yeah it's crazy. yeah and we saw the same thing in the u.s right i think the uh the uh, gallup poll and a kaiser poll coming to those results whereas if you looked at the polling you know four or five years ago fewer people knew about vaping but among those who did you know more tended to see it as a harm reduction thing as opposed to a, a dangerous thing yeah for sure um if if anybody has any questions go ahead and drop them in chat we have about another 15 minutes or so um so kind of what are your thoughts about the uh, about the future? I mean, this year definitely seems like it's going to be rough from a from a, a you know, regulatory standpoint, especially in some of the states. Yeah, you know, I mean, and basically you have small groups, you know, the vape shop owners and Kassan, a range of others, Greg Connolly and his folks, the Vaping Technology Association. You had people mobilizing. Um, Obviously, what was most impressive was that rally. I think, Matt, you were there, right? The rally outside the White House. Um, And you had the work that, um, you know, Grover Norquist and his colleague Paul Blair did and engaging Trump's pollster to make the argument that this is not going to be in his political interests. Um, Now, what's going to happen at the states? I mean, just seeing that ban rush through New Jersey the other day, Mm -hmm. um, almost impossible to stand up against that. 
I, I'm trying to figure out where there's going to be a sort of line drawn in the sand on this thing or where there's going to be a position to sort of stop the forward momentum and push back and to do so not with behind the scenes effort. I mean, not just with behind the the scenes efforts by lobbyists and advocates, but with, with some public playing out of this issue. And and oftentimes the problem is that oftentimes it takes money. I don't know where that's going to come from. I know it is crucially important because, you know, one of the things that's going on is you have folks trying to organize the vape shop owners, et cetera, on a local level. But I think there's not a long tradition of advocacy and collaboration. So, you know, I, I oftentimes hear about a God, if we could only get the vape shop owners to look beyond their own noses and, you know, to coalesce and to form a powerful group that could mobilize. But then again, there are also small business people who are, you know, consumed with running a business. It's not as if they have lots of time to be showing up at the Capitol. So I think, you know, where this is going to play and whether there's a certain state that can provide a role model for stopping this stuff somewhat um, I'm not sure where that's going to happen. Yeah, I'm not sure where. It's gonna happen. The, the tough thing is, is like with with the the thing with Trump, we were forced to play politics. We were backed into a corner, and you had to play politics, and so you had to talk votes, and you had to do polling and whatnot. Then he softened his tone a little bit on it, and uh, you know didn't do a full ban, did a partial ban. But then because it's political now, his his uh, you know political enemies seem to seem to kind of step in deeper into, into their position and uh, hate vaping even more because Trump went too soft on it, in their opinion. So it's yeah. kind of this no, political, I, you know, back and forth. Thing. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's also the fact that if you look in some, I'm looking in California, you know, I, I mean, a Democratic politician is going to stand up against these kind of hysterical upper middle class white parents who are freaking out about kids juuling and stuff like that. That's a type of political courage that's rare. Now, the question is, will this play out a little more in some Midwestern places? You know, I was a little surprised to see the governor of Michigan be one of the first, the Democratic governor of Michigan, be one of the first to jump on the banning flavored uh, e-cigs, because Michigan is a more mixed Midwestern state. It is something of a swing state. Uh, uh, I mean, obviously, she's responding to similar sorts of pressure and, 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 uh, and communications as, as, as folks in other states. But I'll be curious to see if this issue can get some kind of higher profile. I think it's also, you know, I have not seen this issue debated much on the national media, on the, the television. I've seen a few. You know, I've seen uh, Dave Abrams from NYU showing up, I think, on NBC. There's been a few things like this. But it's not, you know, it's now that some of the, the, the with Trump stepping back, making his decision, and a lot of these battles playing at the state level, I'm not sure how this, how the public's going to get well educated on this issue. Yeah, it's 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 a challenge. Yeah, it's going to take some time for sure. Um, Danielle Jones asked a question. She said, "I would like to hear Ethan's thoughts on the usage of the word addiction." <laughs> That's a great question. Um, my general view is to avoid the phrase. I mean, first of all, generally avoid the phrase addict because it is a stigmatizing phrase. To call somebody an addict is not quite as bad as calling them a junkie, but I, I have generally tried to avoid, you know, it's usually a person struggling with drugs, yeah. right, or a person dependent upon drugs, and to only use words like drunkie or addict if I'm using it for sort of dramatic effect to make a, a broader point. When it comes to addiction, I remember one of the intellectual exercises I used to put people through when I was teaching or running my organization was I say, write what you want to write, use the phrase addiction if you like, and then go back and substitute in where you wrote addiction what you actually meant by your use of the term right there, addicted or addiction or addict. And what oftentimes you'll find is that people will use the same word addiction in the course of, say, a thousand-word essay to mean very different things. Right. Or I've alternately said to people, try saying or writing what you want to say without using the phrase or the word addiction, because it's used in a way that's not clear. Because when I use the phrase in one way, it may bring up a whole different notion or set of associations in the listener. So I think we should generally avoid it. The last thing I'll say, when I'm asked to give a definition of addiction, the definition I give is addiction equals dependence plus problem. 
Addiction equals dependence plus problems. And by that, I mean that one can be dependent on a drug in the way a diabetic is dependent upon insulin or somebody with heart disease is dependent upon a heart drug or the way somebody who's been addicted to illegal heroin is now dependent upon methadone or buprenorphine. In other words, you're dependent on taking it every day or that I may be dependent on my coffee every morning or I don't feel right. But if that dependence is not causing any real harm in your life, it's not an addiction. It's just a dependence. Conversely, I may have a problem with a drug. I may, when I drink, sometimes do incredibly stupid things, or I may, you know, uh, uh, you know, just have a problematic relationship with a drug. But I'm not dependent upon it. I'm not. I'm not using it every day. I don't need it, or I start to get the shakes or the shivers, or, or whatever, keep functioning. And so I would say that's not addiction either. So my best definition of addiction is addiction equals dependence plus problem. And it means that when we're talking about cigarettes, we tend to talk about cigarette addiction because we know there's a pretty damn good chance, maybe 50 percent, that if you stick with it, it's going to kill you prematurely and it is going to be undermining your health. But when it comes to e-cigarettes or for that matter, Icos or snus or, or patches or gums or whatever it might be, I would not call that addiction, even if one is dependent upon it, because if you're using it in a way – which is causing little or no harm to yourself, that's not addiction. That's dependence. And some dependence is actually perfectly okay and sometimes even medically necessary for the benefit of your own health. Yeah. Um, Bruce Nye asked, how do we take what drug policy is attempting to do to teach kids about risks and apply it to this controversy? Well, I mean, it is that basic, I, I mean, when people would ask me about harm reduction, I'd say I would give, you know, basically four definitions of harm reduction. The first one would simply be harm reduction starts off as needle exchange. You know, the recognition in the early 80s that people injecting drugs were spreading and contracting HIV by sharing infected syringes. And so it was a simple way, stop the deadly disease for which we have no cure by making sterile syringes more readily available and getting rid of the dirty ones. That was the first one. But the second one was any form of, 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 any, any intervention or policy that seeks to reduce the harm of an activity that can be risky or dangerous, right? And so the examples I would use is um, designated driving norms, right? We don't want people, especially for young people, we don't want people, get, well, you don't want young people, you know, getting drunk. But if they do, we definitely don't want them driving, right? So getting the notion of designated driving norms out there is harm reduction. Seat belts. There used to be the claim that if you put seat belts in, people will drive faster, right? And maybe there's a tiny bit of truth to that. I don't know. But the bottom line was we know seat belts save lives, seat belts harm reduction. We know that skateboarding or skiing or playing football or motorcycling are all somewhat dangerous activities, but wearing a helmet or pads is a form of harm reduction of reducing the harms and the risks that result from this activity, right? And so it's that basic idea. Right. That that if there are things that people are doing that we don't like, there are ways to reduce the harms associated with that by changing the form of the drug, the form of the behavior, by putting on protective wear. I think that's the most important thing. You know, when I was running Drug Policy Alliance, um, we started a project called Safety First. And it was the basic idea for young people. And it was the, the basic idea that, look, the first message to young people with respect to drugs should be don't do it. The second message to kids with respect to using drugs should be don't do it. The third message was to kids should be, look, if you do do it, there's some things I want you to know. Because my bottom line at the end of the day isn't whether, you know, is whether you do it or you don't do it. My bottom line is you're going to come home safely at the end of the night and hopefully grow up and make me healthy grandkids. That's my bottom line. So it's about focusing on the bottom line of, of, of people, and especially kids, health and safety. That's what matters most, more than whether they did it. Same thing applies to sex education as well, right? Worry less about did you or didn't you and more about the health and safety of the people involved. Yeah, and the harm reduction issue really seems to stick with the, the younger generations more where like, you know, they're they're doing it on their own as far as 
you know, like with marijuana use, they're vaping marijuana. Now, yes, we had the lung illnesses, but that was a whole different issue because of a, cer- a certain ingredient being used. But they seem more in tune with with harm reduction as a concept. And maybe it is because their sex education was different than a lot of our older generations. And, and they're getting taught a little bit differently about drugs, at least some of them. And so there is some hope there where at least they seem to, to be, a, you know, like, for example, with marijuana, it's not like there's a, the numbers are going up, but they're transitioning from smoking to vaping it or smoking to, to edibles well, or whatever. I, I, yeah, yeah I mean, it's really interesting. When you, actually, when you look at it, it turns out that young people in polls are better educated about risks than are the adults. Yeah. So if you look, for example, at the relative risk of smoking and vaping, young people are, are, are the, 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 the part of the population that is most accurate, most consistent with science, is young people, not older people. And when it comes to the relative risk associated with marijuana, same thing, right? When it comes, I mean, the interesting thing is young people seem to get it more than the adults. And we live in a world where we think adults to be paternalistic and to make sure and protect the young people, whereas if the young people are actually better informed than the adults who are making policy to affect them, they think. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question. What do you? What do we need to do to get drug policy groups to take a visible stand against vaping restrictions? Well, I think it's really about engagement. I mean, I, I know that before I left Drug Policy Alliance in, uh, you know, May 2017, after you know, founding and running it for a long time, I began, I introduced this issue to my board and most people were sympathetic. We never formalized the position, but, you know, my staff had the, the, you know, the freedom to write and to speak out in favor of tobacco harm reduction and vaping. So we were generally inclined that way. I think that, you know, with respect to um, Drug Policy Alliance now, which is leading drug policy reform organization, there's definitely people there get it. And the question is whether or not they have the bandwidth to also take on this other issue. I think the prospect of of all of these local bans and other sorts of bans becoming increasingly criminalized, we're going to see more and more people beginning to get you know, arrested. We're going to begin to see police getting involved in this stuff. We're just going to see more and more proposals to drug test kids without cause of the sort that we saw with marijuana in years past. Um, I think that you're going to see the drug policy reform organizations getting more engaged. And then when it comes to the leading harm reduction organizations, which is Harm Reduction Coalition in the U.S. and Harm Reduction International, I think they also get it in principle. And once again, it's a matter of bandwidth and whether it's time for them to take this thing on. I know there's a few interesting things going on right now. I think a few studies to see whether or not, because among, you know, if you look at which populations smoke most heavily, Generally, it's mentally ill population has got the highest rate of smoking. Yeah. It's also true that people who have problems with illicit drugs tend to have high rates of smoking. And, and you know, the expression used to be, what's the smokiest room in America? It's an AA meeting or an NA meeting, right? It's people who have been struggling with other substances using that. So there's an interesting question to say that targeting at people who have been struggling with illicit drugs right, would be the right thing to do. And also asking the question, if people who have struggled with heroin, cocaine, booze, or other drugs like that, if they can make the switch to smoke from smoking to vaping, is there some spillover benefit in terms of how they relate to their other drugs that they've had problems with? And I think people are just beginning to look into that issue right now. Yeah, I think uh, we need to, and some some like on Kassar are already doing this, but to do more outreach with like the LGBTQ community as well, you know, who had a really high rate of smoking. And there's a lot of vapors in that community now. But we kind of need yeah, to it makes be me we need surprised to... here. In, yeah, I was just saying, here in San Francisco with a large LGBTQ community, you would have thought that would have been more of a factor in keeping San Francisco from being the national leader oh. in banning vaping. And I'm not sure why it did not play out that way. I know it's very, very odd. Um, but yeah, we definitely need, because that's the one really interesting thing about this is like, there's, there's smokers from all walks of life, you know, like there's a lot of smokers in the red States and there's a lot of smokers in, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, there's older smokers, there's younger smokers, there's people of all different colors, all different sexual backgrounds and trying to kind of have this umbrella and be inclusive with everybody is really important in, in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it really is. And of course, the question always is, is how many people are willing to engage and and make this 
uh, an important part of their life. You know, for a long time, I remember that one of our allied organizations, Normal, the National Organization for Marijuana Laws, yeah. you know, they were always say, my God, we have tens of millions of Americans smoking weed. If only every one of them was giving us, you know, 20 bucks a year, 50 bucks a year, and be getting commit, we would really step out. But in fact, the vast majority of people don't incline, aren't inclined to get politically engaged. And here you have millions and millions of vapors. You do have three million people who have fully switched, right, we think, from smoking to vaping, and for whom the slogan, you know, this is not, I think you told me, you were the first one to tell me the slogan, Matt, you know, this is not a lifestyle for ish, us, this is a life or death issue. You know, it was a powerful, a powerful claim. The we vape, we vote hashtag, or I vote, I vote hashtag, that obviously had some impact, I think, in moving Trump. So it requires some level of political engagement. Now, the more serious these bans become, um, the question will become whether that will be enough to juice some people into real action. And that we'll have to see. Ultimately, political victory in terms of pushing back these anti-science bans is going to require moving a lot of people who don't smoke or don't vape and who have to come at this in terms of what's rational public policy, what works for people they know, people they care about. So it is going to be a struggle. And a huge amount of harm was created this past year, you know, with um, all the hysteria and the really deliberate miscommunication by CDC and others and the terrible coverage by the media, including elite media and the role of politicians and being utterly irresponsible. So just digging ourselves out of that, it reminds me of how much time we've had to spend digging ourselves out of this horrific drug war for decades because of the hysteria that happened in the 80s. Yeah. And not just the 80s, but, you know, we have no choice. Well, and like uh, someone brought out a point here. They said the difference between stigma against marijuana of the past and the negativity against e-cigs of today is social media. The news cycle is instant and average person doesn't read more than the headlines. So, yeah, it's a message, a, a message of misinformation can get spread even faster nowadays. Than, than it used to be. And that's, that's a tough battle for sure. Well, it's also, you know, one of the important roles that medical marijuana played back in the 90s and, and the aughts was that it allowed us to shift the imagery of who was a marijuana consumer. So until the mid 90s, I would, you know, I, here I was a professor at Princeton. I, you know, wear my tie jacket, whatever it was. I give interviews. There was a politician. There were famous, you know, intellectuals and conservatives like William Buckley, Milton Friedman, liberals, others. But inevitably, the media, what photo? Maybe they show our photo, but they were much more inclined to plot a photo of some teenager with, you know, hemp leaves in his blonde dreadlocks with a great big blunt and marijuana smoke, yeah. right? And that was the imagery that played it. On TV, they almost always were showing imagery of smoking and this and all this sort of stuff. Now, once we move forward with legalizing medical marijuana, first in our TV act, and then otherwise, it began to become about ordinary Americans. It began to come about my aunt or my, my grandmother, you know, who had chemo, was dealing with chemotherapy for breast cancer and was smoking a little joint. It was about the cousin or the friend who was dealing with AIDS wasting syndrome or had multiple sclerosis and needed the marijuana for that. So we began to humanize it. In the, in the legislative hearings, people would come in, you know, you know, who were clearly disabled. Or what happened then, as the evidence emerged the last 10, 15 years about the benefits of of marijuana and, and, and CBD for these infants who had this terrible form of epilepsy, a Dravet syndrome it's called, you know, and their parents showing up and basically nobody wanted to get in their way. You know, you, it was about humanizing this issue and shifting the imagery. And I think the importance now for people who have shifted from smoking to vaping and being able to testify being able to have their children, their siblings, their loved ones say, I was worried my daddy was going to die, but I know this thing is going to save his life. And here's the evidence of the medicine doctors. That humanization, right? And that my, da my dad didn't stop, didn't quit smoking until, until he tried that mango flavor. He tried the creme brulee flavor. connect the human element with the science element and counter the stuff about the, the you know around the whole fear-based campaigns around kids right now yeah i totally agree well we are that went fast we're over an hour we'll go ahead okay. and end it there appreciate you coming on man we'll have to do it again <laughs>
Yeah, no, Madison, my pleasure. And listen, I also appreciate the role that you personally played in being my, my tuner on some of these issues as I begin to really immerse myself in this field. So thank you for that. And thank you for everything you're doing with the show and your advocacy and all of that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully uh, we get to uh, meet face to face again when I wasn't, you know, just on a flight for 13 hours and right. barely, barely any sleep. <laughs> I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. Right. Okay, Matt, you All take right. care. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. And thanks everyone for tuning in. We appreciate it. And we'll, we'll see you next Monday.